Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's learning collaborative. We are going to go ahead and get started by welcoming Dr. Vernell DeWitty to give today's opening remarks. Dr. DeWitty, please take it away. Thank you, Jasmine. And good afternoon, everyone. I would like to welcome you to the November HBCU Learning Collaborative. <coughs> we hope that you are all enjoying um, a really good day today, and we appreciate your taking time from your busy schedules to be with us for this hour. On behalf of the leadership and the staff at the Center to Champion Nursing in America, I thank you all for taking this time to engage in this important discussion. The Future of Nursing Campaign for Action is happy to bring today's webinar that is focused on race and social justice. Before we go much further, I would like to mention that we are recording today's webinar so that if you miss a section or you would like to pass it along to a colleague, you will be able to find the recording at www.campaignforaction.org forward slash webinar. I now have the honor of introducing you to today's presenters. To save some time, I will not read their full biographies. <coughs> However, they are available on the website along with the recording of today's webinar. I would also like to mention that as we move along in today's discussion, please feel free to enter any questions or comments that you might have into the chat box. And now, our first presenter is Dr. Janice Brewington, who is the Chief Program Officer and the Director for the Center for Transformational Leadership at the National League for Nursing. Our second speaker will be Dr. Frida Outlaw, who is the Executive Program Consultant for the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration <clears throat> for the Minority Fellowship Program at the American Nurses Association. Our third outstanding presenter for this afternoon will be Dr. Cheryl Taylor, who is Associate Professor for Nursing at Southern University a and in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Dr. Taylor is a student development expert and innovative academic administrator. And with that, I invite Dr. Brewington to please get us started for the afternoon. Good morning. Well, it's, it is afternoon. It may be morning wherever some of you are, but it's such a pleasure to be here with you. And the reason it's a pleasure is because you're here. And you could be doing something else, but you decided to come and spend time with us. So I'm going to start off because our theme is to tell the truth. And so it is about how do we tell the truth in the midst of the environment that we are in. So I'd like to say We Wear the Mask by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. We wear the mask that grins and lies. It hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. This debt we pay to human guile. With torn and bleeding hearts, we smile. And mouth with myriad subtleties. Why should the world be overwise? In counting all our tears and sighs. Nay, let them only see us while we wear the mask. We smile, but oh, great Christ, our cries to thee from tortured souls arise. Beneath our feet, and long the mile, but let the world dream otherwise. We wear the mask, and we all wear the mask at some points and sometimes in our lives. And so when pa Paul Lawrence Dun Dunbar published this poem, it was a reaction to the racial climate in the late 19th century. And he talks about hypocrisy, deception, and the fact that black Americans often resorted to seemingly content con to be cont content with their social circumstances, but we know that's not true. And during slavery, it was a form of protection. So the, poem, the po poet used this metaphor as the mask to illustrate the false persona that people put on to hide their real feelings and true emotions from other people. 
And so he says we wear the mask and it's a personification because the mask can actually grin or lie, but it just shades our eyes and then people won't be able to see who we really are. And sometimes in this society, we do wear the mask because it is, is it about the racism that we've been exposed to all of our lives that makes us wear the mask because sometimes we don't trust people so we wear the mask. But what's important is to know when you need to wear the mask and why you wear the mask, but not allow you to take advantage of opportunities. So we're supposed to talk about our story. You know, all of us have a story and we all have different stories, but all of our stories are powerful stories. And one of the things that we have to make sure we don't allow people to do is to discount or marginalize our stories and who we are, because that is important. Now, I grew up in segregation. And of course, that's some time ago. And when I grew up, I remember vividly going to Montgomery Ward's department store with my grandmother. And there was a water fountain that said colored and one that said white. Well, of course, being a child, I started to drink out of the white water fountain. My grandmother jerked me so hard, I thought maybe I'd had a crook in my neck. But and the place in which we lived. And also what was important about the segregation that I lived in was that we lived in a community. We lived in a community where there was people cared about you. I grew up in the black church and in the black church is where I learned leadership. And I don't know if any of you remember when there were these programs, they had a program for everything, whether it was for Father's Day, Mother's Day, Children's Day, whatever. And if you could walk, you could stand up, you were in the program. Even if you had a sign that said Jesus, you were in the program. And then when you began to speak, then they would have a little piece over on the side to help you know what, you're, what you were going to say, right? And so I grew up learning leadership. I became the announcer in our church when I was in junior high school. And so that was really important in terms of learning leadership, learning public speaking. I went to uh, all segregated schools from elementary school through uh, college. So some of you all may be out there. So I, I went to North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University. So I have to say Aggie pride. And that was pride in terms of how we were, how we were grown and how we were developed in that environment, which was important. And that helped me to be able to navigate other systems because when I was, went to get my master's, I was at Emory University in Atlanta where there were 6,000 students at the time and only 600 blacks. And I was one out of 50 in my class getting my master's. So when I was, I was accepted into the program, but we had to, we were supposed to have an interview. So of course, during that time, that was in 1970, I had the biggest Afro you could imagine. But what I knew in terms of systems, I knew that I could not go down to Emory University for that interview with my Afro. Not at that time because of the biases and how I may have been perceived. So of course, I got it straightened and I went down, had my interview and they looked me over to see who I was, how I talked. All of that was really important at that time. And so I got in at Emory and then I went to UNC Chapel Hill to get my PhD in health policy and administration from the School of Public Health and uh, organizational behavior from the School of Business. And so that was an interesting dynamic also. I had a great experience there, but of course, I was only, I was one out of 11 in the School of Public Health. And so it's about how does this shape you? How did that shape me in relationship to who I am now? And it has because I learned how to navigate, but I learned that at North Carolina A&T State University. 
And I also learned because I had mentors and I didn't realize that I learned leadership from my grandmother. When I was growing up, she said, gal, get your education. She said, but always make sure you make a difference in somebody else's life. And she said to me, don't let anyone ever take away your character, your self-respect and your dignity. And so I remembered that because that, those words are part of my core values. And your core values are so important as you are trying to navigate systems. When you're living in a racist world, you have to be clear about what your core values are. Because if you don't have core values, people can make you do anything and they can make you say anything. But when you have integrity, when you have, you respect people and, and you respect humanness in terms of how we live and where we live, and it doesn't matter who you are. What matters is how you treat people. That's what's important. And that's the core, you know, of my existence because it becomes about your calling, you know, so, when my grandmother said, make a difference in somebody else's life, that was about my calling, but I didn't know that until later on in my life, that that was my calling. So what I know in terms of how I've navigated systems and who has helped me navigate systems, when I think about my mentors, I think about Dr. Hattie Bassent, Dr. Gloria Smith. I think about Dr. Elizabeth Carnegie, because as a matter of fact, Dr. Carnegie was responsible for me getting my PhD because she came to UNCG as a um, visiting professor or endowed chair. And I told her I wanted to do that. And she said, well, Janice, I'm on the advisory board for the American Nurses Association Ethnic Racial Minority Fellowship Program, which is where Dr. Outlaw is. And so when she said that, I said, yes, I do. And so I got money from <coughs> that organization so that I could get my PhD. So you see, it's important to know who can help you and build relationships. Relationships is so important in the midst of all, in the midst of this racist society. And it's about understanding how to develop mentors because I got where I am, not because of myself, but because of everyone who touched my life. I was growing up in my neighborhood, in my church, in my community, and in my professional life. So one of the things I always know, and my grandmother said this too, never forget who you are, where you came from, where are you going, how are you gonna get there? And who is going to help you get there? And she said, make sure that you do that because that's important in life. So you see, we're here not because of us. We're here because other people laid the ground and the foundation for us to be who we are and where we are. And so it's important to reach back and give back and especially to our young students. Thank you so very much for those outstanding remarks, Dr. Brewington. Uh, really great pearls of wisdom. And so now we're going to, we're going to have questions and answers. Uh, and now we're going to move on to our next presenter, Dr. Outlaw. Thank you so much, Jen, for set, Jen, for setting the stage and talking about how we got where we got and. Uh, what I'm going to do as a good site nurse is sort of fit the context of how we were the same and how we're different, but it's but we how we all in systems theory get back to the same place. And when you were talking about Paul Lawrence Dunbar, Dunbar, Dunbar it really flashed me back to church times and also Franz Fanon. 
who talked about the black face and the white mask, the, you know, the real activist in him. And when I was trying to think about how to frame this addressing race and social justice issues among students and faculty, I was listening to Eddie Glock, who was talking about knowing, deciding whether to fix the problem and how you fix the problem, you have to face your truth. Everybody has to face the truth. And then the Academy of Pediatrics that put out a, a statement that said, until, you, until they could deal with their racist acts of the past, not admitting people of color into their organizations, they had to call on reconciliation. And that's the only way you're gonna have transformation and equity. So that, that's how I'm compelled now to frame my remarks in that context. But let me just say who we are first. I, I could just, I, I was just resonating with you about how you grew up. I grew up a little differently that my father was a coal miner. So the town was owned by U.S. Steel. U.S. Steel was in, was interested in getting that coal out of the out of the mountains, so they weren't interested in. We had no segregated water fountains, although we had segregated schools. We didn't have segregated physicians. They had we had socialized medicine. They hired physicians, physicians that take care of everybody, and they weren't gonna have any stuff about that. But there were nuances of segregation. I had a community that was black. I had a church that was black. All of that. So having said that, my mother was also my first mentor, and she said education is important for women. And if I have to go without everything, you will be it. You and your sister will be educated. And that's where I got the notion. She never said when you go to if you go to college. She would say when. And my mother would not buy us many clothes, but she used to say when you go to college, I'm gonna buy you. You can get could choose to match your dresses. So that was the carrot for me, among other things. But and I had a community that supported me. And when you were talking about learning leadership, I went to the Henry McNeil Turner Society. And we learned to give recitations and speak. And I also, at 10 years old, navigated, lead, talking about leadership, the choir. I played for the choir at 10 years old. Now, you can imagine navigating that. So my core values, though, so my truth is centered in the context of my core values, to serve my community in places that I find myself professionally. And that includes clinical practice, education, research policy, advocacy, and to keep those values as the principles that keep me focused on my goals. And my goal has been to succeed in serving those with whom I have chosen and committed to serve. And so that's been my lived my lived experience I've had. And the difference in the nuance and the difference, I'm just fascinated with this, is I had all of my professional nursing education in majority schools. It wasn't my choice. I wanted to go to FIS first and Hampton second. And I got into Hampton. FIS had, uh, had um, dismantled their school by the time I, their school of nursing by the time I went. But my mother thought I was much too young and much too inexperienced mm -hmm. to be going mm -hmm. off to um, a different, a, a, a school like Hampton, because she said there were too many men in the town. And she was probably right. She said I was too young at that point to be in that, in that kind of environment. So off I went to Korea College and we had a, we had, Women there had a name for Greer College. We called it girls' school because the boys. We there was a, a lot of, oh, there were a lot of segregation between girls and men and women and that kind of thing, which is a story for another time. But I want to talk about some of the barriers and the challenges and the strategies that people can take advantage of, or that I experienced and I learned from it, and I want to share that. But I want to share it um, with an undergird of theory uh, of things that have been proven that and have some support from academic research and experience. So I want to talk about this, this notion of imposter syndrome, for instance, which is for a lot of us who, who may already know about this, it's a constant relentless belief that you're not good enough, that you don't know enough, and that you're fake and somebody's gonna find you out. 
No, I didn't have much of that when I was growing up um, in in my town. My town is Lynch, Kentucky. It's in the real eastern part of Kentucky, Harlan County, which is famous for um, a lot of murder and that kind of stuff around unionization of the coal mines back in the 20s and the 30s. But um, I had, I was, um, my aunt, Henrietta Sweat, was the first grade teacher. So in the summer, we would have class and I, I thought I would learn how to, I would run the classroom with Henrietta Sweat and she showed me very different from that. When I got there, I got my first spanking the first day for trying to take over the classroom. But anyway, um, when I went to Berea College, though, which is a predominantly white school, I was faced with kids who had gone to boarding school, who had a lot more resources than I had had in my education. Now, it's very common that um, all of us, I think if we all reflect, we can say we've been in situations at some particular point in time when we say, how did I get here? I, I, everybody knows more than me. Maybe I don't know enough. So, we, so the imposter syndrome is a common syndrome. But what is different with many women and prevalently, most prevalently found among African-American women, and we, we want to put, include men, but the imposter syndrome, because of that intersection of race, gender, and sometimes social class, is highly identified with African-American women because of our experiences of racism, discrimination, sexism, and verbal uh, microaggressions. And so, therefore, nurses of color have always faced a, a double whammy of race and gender um, and when we've been trying to do what we do and what we can do so well. So when I got to Berea, all of a sudden, I wasn't the first child in the first row in the first seat. And I had to really deal with that about why was I there? And, and so that was, that was um, it could have been a barrier. I took it as a challenge, though. I really knuckled down and I worked really, really hard. And I tried to get help where I could get help. And I got, and I did really well my first semester, but I got a C in something. And my mother was all aghast because I got a C. And I was like, mother, you know, I don't usually go up against you, but look, I'm, I'm working hard and I'm doing well. This C, I'm proud of this C because I turned something that could have been catastrophic to something that was a challenge to me and I was able to deal with that. So when we talk to our students and to our faculty, what is the barrier? And imposter syndrome is destructive because it impacts your performance, both academically and professionally. I have a friend that I talk with a lot, a nurse friend. And sometimes when we have experience like, like this, we, we sort of check out with each other and we say, you can talk yourself out of what you really do know. So sometimes when you can go someplace, you really know, and you're top of your game, but you can get yourself into something when these feelings come upon you that you start to have self-doubt, which can morph into destructive self-statements, and it leads to a magnified sense of self-doubt. And then you get paralyzed, and so then you don't do your best. And that's what's so insidious. But most of all, the imposter syndrome can limit your aspirations that sometimes people just stop aspiring to do what they could really do well because they, they get paralyzed with these, um, these, the, this syndrome or these feelings. And I'm going to say, I'm going to give my, I have an example because I know that we like examples, but I want to get in all my real points. So I'm going to go to my, to my other points that I want to make, and then I'm going to circle back to my example, because I know as nurses, we all like the narrative, the story, and the clinical example, right? We, we like that. So the, the part of imposter syndrome that I think that we can, we can really tackle is identifying and really embracing the idea of mentorship. That it, and Janet's talked about mentorship and what it meant to her and how she developed because she had these wonderful mentors. And it's an important strategy and it's a key to managing the feelings from the imposter syndrome. 
And what I want to say to faculty in HBCUs that I totally believe and am committed to the building strong mental mentoring programs is a key. It is a vital key. How you develop it, how you vision it, envision it, I think is up to your own ingenuity. However, I think that there are some basic principles that go across the whole notion of how you want to build it. And my colleague, Dr. Um, Taylor has a wonderful article on embracing mentors and facing tormentors that I read last night and I chuckled and I reflected and it was great. And I have one that I'm going to put up that I wrote when I was in my postdoctoral program about how you mentor, how mentors and mentees can grow when you're the same and when you're different. Dr. Um, Outlaw, we yeah. have about one minute left, please. Okay. So I'm going to say why mentorship programs are essential. They help the student or the faculty member build confidence. They discuss feelings with it. You can discuss feelings with a trusted person. It's someone to help the mentee to pay attention to their own negative self-talk and reframe it to a positive thought. A mentors, strong mentors help the mentee to learn to be uncomfortable. And I think this is something that if I don't nail anything else home, we have to teach our students, and we have to internalize it ourselves, how to be in uncomfortable in these times. These are not comfortable times. So we have to learn how to be uncomfortable and use those feelings to, to spare us on to meet the challenge that we, do, we need to meet, and that we need to guide the students and the faculty to accept what they don't know and learn it. And when all other fails, remember, um, that um, that you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to know everything. You just have to have that drive to learn it. And partly, the last thing I'm going to say, Dr. D. Witty, is that part of the learning is you have to go outside of nursing. And you have to read things that are outside of nursing that inform your practice as you nurse. And one of the things I came up with, so how do you do that? I think faculty book clubs would be a wonderful way so that everybody makes the commitment to read this information, to process it, to analyze it, to see what's good, what you throw away, and how you use it to have your students be more um, informed so that they can have healthy, inclusive conversations and you can be informed to help them as they, help, as they learn. So there I go. Thank you so very much. That I mean, that was absolutely spectacular. And now our third presenter is Dr. Taylor. Yes. Um, wow. That was amazing, uh, Dr. Brewington and Dr. Outlaw. And uh, I thank you. And when you said book club, I, I remembered something that um, I started requiring uh, for my classes that the students read um, Dr. Basent's book, which was a story, and it, it's an NLN produced book, a story of how all of these great women of color, African-American nurses became navigated and became leaders. And uh, also Carnegie's book, The Path We Tread. I, I required that and I wish that that were that were required textbooks in every nursing program it doesn't matter what your background or demographic is because there's so much to be learned there and i found that i uh i had to i didn't have to explain as much and and go back and and re explain history and try to teach history to people who never had history of nursing and history of African-American nursing because of Dr. Carnegie's book, The Path We Tread, and we're still treading it, and also uh, because of Dr. Basent's book. So uh, I think the idea of reading and, and then being able to dialogue and debrief is wonderful. So my journey is so similar to their journey. And um, you can probably see, even though we don't show our age, uh, 
you can probably see that we're from another generation of um, nursing education. And, uh, and I'm a graduate of Dillard uh, University, but my journey started in high school uh, when I read in a little um, advertisement on the bus because I was a public high school student about a nursing program that was being offered in high school. So I applied for that and it was targeting a certain demographic. We've always been targeted for one thing or another, sometimes good, sometimes bad, but this was a good target. And the idea was to uh, teach nurses how, teach um, high school students how to become licensed practical nurses. When they graduate from nursing, they'll graduate from high school. So then they take the LPN board and I was a 16 year old high school graduate licensed practical nurse. And um, the idea behind that program was, you know, these people from this catchment area will never have the opportunity to go to college and be, you know, at the Harvards and Yales and the schools that almost, there are some schools that define who people are. It doesn't matter how smart they are, but the association with those institutions. And so the idea behind that was, but let's give them something, let's give them a trade. And so I, I graduated from that program, but I had mentors like you all had African-American and Caucasian who saw the light in me. And I would say it's so important to see the light in our students, whether I'm Dean or whether I'm a faculty, whether I'm a staff, it's easy to see the problem because the problem is uh, overblown on the six o'clock news, but we have a mission to see the light. So they saw the light in me and even as an LP, as a 16 year old LPN, it was like, what are you doing here? You need to go back to school and go to college. And so I entered Dillard University, not as an LPN, I wanted to have uh, the college life experience. And um, I, I went to an HBCU and I think it's important for us to remember that it says historically, that's a big key word, historically black college and university. It doesn't mean that's the way it is now. One of the myths about the HBCU is, it's like it was when I was, when I went to school. My experiences are, you know, I can teach from my experiences. The students I'm teaching now, they, uh, they're going to have those kind of experiences. Not so. My class had one Caucasian student and four African students, students who came from Africa to study nursing. They were actually nurses in their own country, but they had to start from scratch in this country. That's how the, the things are always played out. And so um, it's a historical a, uh, college, black college and university, but what I experienced and what Dr. Brewington and Janet experienced, the students that we have now, they didn't come out of segregation. They came out of many different places and spaces, integrated spaces. I mean, we have students who go attend all white schools or certain specialty schools and their first experience with African Americans, I'm talking about African American students, might be at an HBCU. I have had students at uh, Southern, I know of a student in the Honors College who was offered full scholarships at Ivy League schools and told his parents, no, I want to go to Southern. I want to go to HBCU because that's the experience he wanted to have at this stage. And his parents went ahead and agreed with that. So it's the different demographic and there are some things that are consistent, 
racism is still alive and well. But the school that I graduated from, Dillard, um, the students had to go out of the state for their clinical experiences because of segregation. Back then, they went to New York and and places like that where they would be allowed to practice in their clinical as student nurses whereas when i attended that school our teachers shared their those experiences with us our teachers were faculty member faculty who spent a significant amount of time in a curriculum that taught them how to teach most of our teachers had um, their masters from Teachers College in Columbia University. So I know I, I only have a few minutes left, but I'm saying all that to say that there are some similarities and there are some differences. And one thing is for sure that was way back then and it exists today. Everyone needs encouragement. Everyone needs encouragement. So seeing the light, providing feedback, teaching, and really caring on a consistent basis, that existed then, that's what got us to where we are, and that all three of us are fellows in the Academy of Nursing. And that is what it takes to, uh, with the students that we're working with today, but it also takes some other um kinds of things because of since dr taylor you have about a two about a half a minute left and then okay. we have some questions for okay. you okay so let me just say um that learning from our history matters and there are a lot of misperceptions about the hbcu when i went to school for it uh, for my doctorate, a teacher, an African-American teacher called me in and said, you're from one of those schools, right? I said, what, what do you mean? She said, you went to Dillard? I said, yes. She said, oh, I'm going to have to, oh, I'm going to have to help you because this is going to be a challenge for you in this environment. And I didn't know how to take that. And so this conversation that we're needing to have about navigating is very important. And I told her that I would accept help, but it couldn't be the kind of help that at the end of the day and at the end of my degree, I would feel somebody else earned it and I received it. I had to earn it. Thank you. That's really, really great. So now we have a few minutes for uh, some questions and answers from our audience, as well as some that we have um, that have come in so that I'm going to um, invite the members of our audience. If you have questions for any of our panelists, please feel free to unmute yourself and speak up. So I'm going to uh, give everyone an opportunity to um, to do that and see if we have some questions coming from the audience. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. What, what you, as you ask your question, could you please identify yourself as well as the school that you're from? My and name is Cynthia Bayanami. I'm the director of the Louisiana Center for Nursing at the Louisiana State Board of Nursing. And I'm a former um, professor, associate professor at Southern University School of Nursing. And I have to say that I'm also a SAMHSA fellow, ANA SAMHSA fellow, and Dr. Cheryl Taylor was my dissertation chair. So. I'm excited to see everyone and Dr. Outlaw and, and Dr. Brewington. So I am just excited to see all of you. Dr. Taylor, you mentioned something about <clears throat> the students that we have today. And I have a personal experience even with my own children. I have three adult children. The youngest one is 20, the oldest one is 25. But my motivation for doing well in school is different from their motivation today. Uh, my motivation was I wanted to make my mother happy, get her out of an environment that I that was not a safe environment um, to be able to provide for her and make her life better. And so that's 
And and again, it made her every degree I received. It was like she received it. She was right there with me. She was so proud of me. Many of the young people today don't have that kind of motivation because like you said, many of them have attended the schools that are majority schools. They've interacted with, ma with majority students. Um, so sometimes it's hard to get them motivated to really want to do excellent. And so how do you address that? Okay, um, I'm glad you asked that question because um, um, sometimes, and I, I, and I can say this because I'm also a member of a sorority, but sometimes we think the way we crossed over and the, what we had to endure, that same methodology is what is required and necessary for the next person to join. So I, I would say first being self-aware and learning as much about the students, their, their background and experience. For example, we know all of the students that we're dealing with now, they come from a technology environment. They, their community, for example, I grew up with encyclopedias. They grew up with social media. Mm -hmm. So for me to, for me as a faculty member, to, to be most effective with those students, I need to have a command of the use of social media and communicate with them in the worlds that they communicate in. And I also need to pay attention to my language. I think it's so beautiful that generation came up with this phrase, Black Lives Matter. In my generation, it was black is beautiful, mm -hmm. but it's the same thing, but that's the way they're articulating it because many of our students are thinking, I don't know if they care because of the way they come across when they're helping us. They think they're helping, but look on what somebody said or how they said it, or how it was presented. And I grew up where you you just overlook that and just assume that a person really cares. So what drives what we do and how we relate to students today? The core value of your family, your community, and the institution that you work at. That mission and core values, that should be uh, you should be a walking example of that and articulate that in the best way possible. And so for me, it's being consistent with the caring, not playing favorites. Okay, you're my favorite. I don't like you. I like you. Smart kids, I'll spend time with because you're smart. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know about you. You're not too, the elevator doesn't go all the way to the top. We have ways of communicating um, beliefs that are inaccurate or not precise. We don't know what these students are going through, how many medications they're taking, what challenges they're dealing with. But we have ways of communicating that I think we can improve on to <laughs> communicate the core value that yes, we care. We're nurses and we care. I'd like to just add one statement to that. And, you know, when Dr. Taylor talked about caring and we have to see students as individuals. We can't and, 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 and respect their differences and we can't render them invisible. We have to see we have to show them that we see them. And we have to take them from where they are. That is so important. Because if you take students from where they are, then their journey will be so much different if you did not. And I think that is critical. And, and the one word that Dr. Taylor said is about caring. It's about caring to make a difference for someone else. 
Dr. Oliver Osborne, I knew when I was in trouble because he prefaced his remarks with, Cheryl, you know I love you. <laughs> so when you know I love you, I knew I was going to be critiqued and turned inside out, upside down, but you know I love you is what I held on to. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Dr. And that helped me to take whatever he had to give, and that was beautiful. Do I have time to say one thing? Dr. Outlaw, go right ahead. Okay, thank you. So I have raised three boys. Um, I think, well, they're men now. They're real men. One's 48, one's 38, and one's 36. And... I, one of the things that I'm always amazed at, and I see it with each generation of students that either my husband teaches and I hear about them, or I, I have taught, because I do some teaching at Vanderbilt occasionally, um, is that I have to think back about when I was their age and how my, my mother, I too was motivated by my mother. And I think that's what all of us have some, I've heard grandmother, mother, but anyway, a lot of mother and grandmother influence here. But I think about when I wore, when I um, put my hair in an afro, I thought my mother was going to, she was like, I'm not going to town with you. You look like, and I'm not going to say what she said. It wasn't a bad word. It was just, it wasn't pleasant. But you got good hair. So why, why are you going to do that? And I think about how I pushed with my mother and how my children pushed with me. And I didn't always understand and how the students pushed with me. And I think the key words are caring, being patient. And I always say they will come around if you mirror and you present in a way that you're not judging, but, and you're trying to get there. And I think the Cheryl is so right. The way that they learn, and I've been, I've been trying to work with it, because when people tell me they want snapshots of information instead of reading an article, my old school gets all up in a roar about that, because I think you can't learn from a snapshot what you can learn from reading something in depth. But I'm also doing some work in ACES where we know that children's brains are developing different in their pathways and neurons. And so they can't, they are learning. I'm looking at my grandchildren. They are learning in different ways than we learn or our generation learned. So I'm, th I'm like, I'm going to pull on Jesse Jackson. I'm going to keep the faith because I believe at the end of the day, they will come around. It may not be what we desired for them. That's the other thing I think. It's not what you desire for them, but it's what they want, what, what they, but if they're good, decent human beings, and if they're good, decent, compassionate nurses, that's all we can hope for. They might do it a little differently, but that's all we can hope for. Okay, I was wondering, are there any other questions from other participants? Well, I, I would like to ask one question uh, for all of the panelists and ask you to weigh in on this one. From your experiences in working with students and in all of your other professional activities, what are some of the success strategies that you would like to offer uh, for schools of nursing to um, increase the academic advancement of students of color in HBCUs and also to increase the first time pass rate on the NCLEX? Okay, so I'd like to um, offer a couple of things at three levels. One, um, administrators or directors of programs. Um, one of the reasons why I earned a, a degree, a master's degree from University of Washington in Seattle was because um, the, the director of a program wrote a grant and was funded to recruit minority students into um, systems oriented community mental health and fund them completely to uh, get advanced degrees and join a workforce in an area that desperately needed um, content, clinical experts, and uh, minorities. 
And so ANA Minority Fellowship Program is one version of that. NIMH, when I was coming along, was a version of that. But um, this faculty went around the country to HBCUs and recruited people from the classes, from the senior classes. And I was one of those persons recruited from Dillard. So um, writing grants to fund, to remove some of the barriers to fund students' advancement helps. Uh, for faculty, I would say that evaluating teaching is important, but evaluating learning is equally important. Mm -hmm. So give equal time. We have teacher evaluations, but give equal time and use best techniques to determine, okay, I know I provided this content, but did the student learn this content? You know, back in the day, we had block curriculum and integrated curriculum. <laughs> well, we don't use those terms now, but a lot of materials provided to students in compartments and they're, they are expected to make the connection, connect the dots, tie everything together. I guess they're expected to do that in clinical, but we need to evaluate how that's done and what are the best ways for them to connect all the complex dots that we are throwing at them in our curriculum packages. And then for uh, students, I think it's important for uh, students to have discipline um, and they learn discipline. I work with honor students. So in that college, they use the law of human performance. Practice makes perfect. So any studying successfully techniques, anxiety management techniques, any techniques that are tried and true are uh, rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed and <coughs> students use those techniques from their freshman year all the way through till they graduate and that becomes a, a practice habit. So the idea of practice make perfect, that there's some scientific basis to that. Yes. But here's the problem, imperfect practice makes imperfection. So if I stay up all night texting, then I'm going to have problems. But if I have a routine of studying, then I'm, I'm more inclined to success. Okay, Dr. Brewington, would you like to add any comments to that? You're muted, Dr. Brewington. Yes, yeah, I think, you know, what becomes important too in terms of students, one of the things I used to say to students about reading, you know, because sometimes students don't like to read. And it's about, you know, when you don't read, you come to class not knowing what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And you also sit in class not knowing what you don't know. And you leave class not knowing what you don't know. So that becomes important. And that alludes to uh, Dr. Taylor, what Dr. Taylor said in relationship to study skills. The other that's important is in terms of assessment. How do you use data? How do you use data, you know, with the students in terms of assessing students' learning, you know, where they are in terms of how they learn, but not only how they learn, but what are they learning? How are they internalizing the learning and, and the knowledge and the information? Because you have to assess that because everyone is different. And so as, as faculty, you know, we have to make sure that we use different strategies in terms of how we work with students, how we teach students. And the other is about, you know, enhancement strategies. What type of enhancement plan do you have when you identify the data? When you've said that a student's having difficulty in this area, what do you do? What strategies are you putting into place? And I mean, intentional strategies, not hit and miss. Thank you, Dr. Brewington. We're running right up against the hour. I wanted to give Dr. Outlaw the last minute if she wanted to add a comment to that. I did. Thank you so much for that. I was, they've talked about the structural things, and I do believe that also as faculty, we set the environment for what we expect of our students. And I think if you do that right away, when they come in and they don't read and you assess that they don't read, then they used to have to go out of my class. 
I couldn't have you come in there not prepared. And, um, you know, and sometimes I might be left to one person. But one of the things I'm going to do as a site nurse is to talk about how to build the how to mediate feelings of being an imposter, because, you know, we all know that anxiety gets in the way when we start to take tests or we think we've been evaluated by people that are outside of our our, our what I'm going to call our bubble and and have people to learn how to calm themselves down. And you can do this. You don't have to go full dive into meditation, although I, I recommend it. But how to learn breathing techniques, a, a short breathing technique before you take an exam, how to step back and talk to yourself and give yourself positive affirmations before you can, that this can be done. They did it. I know I can do it. I can, you can build those skills in, in students so that they do feel like they are not an imposter and they can realize that they can do it, but they've got to do the work too. You can't just Thank do you. it and not Thank do the work. So very much, Dr. Outlaw. We, you know, we, you, you had such uh, rich conversations and so much to offer, but our time is pretty much up for today. And, you know, we'll, we'll need to reconnect and continue this conversation. So once again, uh, thank you so very much for our outstanding panelists for sharing your wisdom, your knowledge, and your experiences. And we're going to invite all of our participants to visit um, the website, campaignforaction.org, uh, where you'll be able to access this webinar. We also uh, placed into the chat box a couple of resources that you might want to download. So um, be sure to follow us on Facebook and on Twitter. And we invite you to um, stay tuned for the next session. And please uh, enjoy your afternoon and uh, take care, be healthy and be safe. Thank you very much. Thank you.